Let's look now at things that control primary productivity in the ocean, namely light and nutrients. Any factor that limits or controls the growth rate of phytoplankton or anything, any kind of cell in a sense, is called a limiting factor. And we talked about limiting factors in chapter six, briefly talking about Liebig's law of the minimum. And that concept, Liebig's law of the minimum, which actually comes from agriculture, says this. That required factor, so this needed substance, whether it's light or fertilizers or some other kind of thing, that factor that's in the least supply is the one that's going to limit the growth. And think about it, that's a very useful principle because now we only need to focus on one thing that's controlling the growth or photosynthetic rate of a particular organism or phytoplankton. Okay, so Liebig's law of the minimum tells us that that single factor that is needed by an organism, but that which is supplied in the smallest amounts or supplied at the least rate, is the one that's going to control the growth of that organism. And this concept is really, uh, though, it, though it came from agriculture, has really um, expanded our way of looking at the ocean and looking at different environments in the ocean and trying to figure out what is, is, what is it that controls primary production in the world ocean. And it's had some really interesting implications, particularly recently um, with the discovery that in some places in the ocean, iron controls rates or limits rates of primary production in the ocean. And as we'll get to a little bit later, we'll talk about ways that perhaps we can increase the productivity of the ocean using addition of iron and by increasing rates of productivity in the ocean, rates of primary productivity in the ocean, the hope is that we'll pull out more carbon out of the atmosphere. So iron fertilization of the oceans is being looked at as one of the remedies for or one of the solutions to, one of the geoengineering solutions to climate change uh, and human contributions to it. Okay. Liebig's Law of the Minimum, um, as I say here, is a really important principle in biological ocean art because in the ocean, really, something is always limiting something else. Though we are talking about in uh, our discussion here, controls on primary productivity um, and focusing mainly on light and nutrients, other things can also limit as well, besides nutrients. Grazing by zooplankton, physical processes, uh, the dying off of phytoplankton, the sinking of phytoplankton, all those things in some way may limit their growth. But again, we're going to focus primarily on two things. That would be light and nutrients. If we look at light intensity in the ocean and or look at light intensity and how it affects growth rate in the ocean, we have a curve that looks something like this. Now, let's take a few moments to look at this. On the x-axis, we have light intensity. So increasing from zero to some quantity. Here we have growth rate. And what we see is that as light intensity increases, the rate of growth increases. But it doesn't increase indefinitely. Turning on more lights or putting the sun, the, the plant even closer to the sun isn't necessarily going to make it grow faster. There's a point at which that's all the light that the plant can absorb in process, and that's called the saturation point. In fact, if you put your plants in too much light, again, the case of putting a fern out in the middle of the bright sunlight, you begin to inhibit the growth of the plant, a process called photoinhibition. This light intensity where saturation is reached is called the saturation light intensity, and that's the maximum amount of light that a particular organism under a particular set of conditions will be able to process or the maximum amount of light or the light level at which growth is maximum. One other thing to notice in this figure, figure 13.9 in the book, is that there's a certain amount of light required before you really start to get positive growth. That's called the compensation light intensity. If you recall, plants also have to use some of the energy they produce. If they didn't use some of the energy they produce, well, they would wither and die, but they need to maintain their cellular processes. They need to maintain their, their cells and their cell structure. And in case of plants or roots and stems and leaves and those kinds of things. So there's a certain cost, a certain respiratory cost associated 
with that. So there's a certain amount of light that's needed just to keep plants in the business. And if you keep plants in the dark forever, they are certainly going to perish. And this light, this graph, describes again the relationship between growth and light intensity and most importantly how light may be an inhibiting factor or a limiting factor excuse me for the growth of phytoplankton and how light can control the growth of phytoplankton in the world ocean <clears throat> well those wavelengths of light that stimulate photosynthesis are called photosynthetically available radiation. And when I talked about the hockey puck at the top of that spectral radiometer, that particular um, piece of the spectral radiometer is actually measuring what's called PAR, or photosynthetically available radiation. And as you recall, or should recall, photosynthetically available radiation, visible light between 400 and 700 nanometers, decreases very quickly in the surface ocean, less quickly as you go deeper, what we call an exponential relationship, where it follows an exponential curve. And that mathematical relationship between light intensity and depth in the ocean is expressed in terms of Beer's Law, which we also talked about in Chapter 7. The depth at which photosynthesis just equals the rate of respiration, so remember from our last curve, that light intensity that just keeps plants in the business, it's generally about the 1% light level. So where the surface intensity is reduced to about 1%, so 1% of surface intensity occurs at some depth, that's called the compensation depth. It's also what we define as the depth, the bottom depth of the euphotic zone. And from the 1% light level to the surface is the region in which photosynthesis occurs. Below the 1% light level, photosynthesis is generally not, uh, growth is not going to occur for phytoplankton. So the euphotic zone is generally considered the photosynthesis zone in the upper ocean. And that would be the 1% light level where photosynthetically available radiation, what we call PAR, is reduced to 1% of its surface value. If we take a look at how this looks like in the two conditions that we talked about and in figure 728, it looks something like this. Here is for a light environment, for a, a water column in which there's lots of attenuation. Remember, you'll recall the absorption of light depends upon, or the, the attenuation of light depends on how much absorbers and scatterers, uh, we might even say how much junk's in the water, how many suspended microbes and inorganic sediments and all those kinds of things, and that's expressed in this quantity KD. So if there's lots of absorbers and scatterers, then we have a high KD, and attenuation is very rapid. We'll have a very shallow euphotic zone. Of course, we'll have a shallow photic zone as well light doesn't penetrate very deeply, and then we don't expect to have much photosynthesis below this depth. If we have a water column with a low KD in which we have fewer absorbers and scatterers, then we have low attenuation, and we have a deep photic zone, and we have light that penetrates more deeply in the water column. And if we follow carbon fixation, in other words, photosynthesis, what we find is it follows these curves quite nicely when light is the limiting factor for photosynthesis or for the growth rate of phytoplankton in the ocean. So here's what carbon fixation, if we were to plot it, would look like theoretically because in this case light is controlling the growth of phytoplankton in the ocean. Okay, so a couple things we've talked about here. One is, those things that alter the light field are going to alter the growth rates of phytoplankton in cases where light is a limiting factor for phytoplankton growth. It's important that you think about these concepts. It's important that you have in mind, have all these kinds of things comfortable in your way of thinking so that when presented with a particular graph or a particular situation, that it makes sense to you that this is a kind of carbon fixation that you would have. But here we are in this case talking about ocean physics affecting ocean biology.